Hello and welcome to the Summer of Best Ball with yours truly, Justin Herzig. It is August 18th. We are three weeks away from the start of the NFL season. Continuing on throughout the summer in the next three weeks, I'll be hosting these underdog best ball streams, bringing on some special guests. You can catch us every Tuesday, Thursday, live on the ETR channel, hosted in partnership with The Owners Club, launching soon a new way to play best ball. Also, I want to give you all a heads up to let people know that everyone who signs up for the ETR Draft Kit Pro will get a free $10 at underdog. Comes with best ball rankings, content, season-long dynasty coverage, everything you need. Even if you already have that underdog account, you'll still get the free $10, no strings attached. And once you get Draft Kit Pro, head over to the Underdog Content Hub on ETR to claim that $10. And if you're new to Underdog, it's not too late. Promo code ETR will get you that $100 deposit bonus. And now, with us this afternoon, the king of the Elijah Moore fan club. The man who was a stat correction away from making the inaugural draft best ball championship. The CEO of Matthew Barry's Fantasy Life. Mr. Elliot Chris, how are you doing? I got to be honest, I was doing a little better before you reminded me about the stat correction. It's kind of, it's funny. We got to meet in person at the expo, but it's, uh, it's rivalry is the wrong word, but uh, I had to pick a rival who would be you because of that <laughs> stat correction that kept me out of the championship. I mean, you, you single-handedly shut down draft because of their uh, <laughs> lack of acknowledging your Thursday stat correction. Um, that's the heavy. Where's the crown? Yeah, I uh, listen, man. It was a, it was a good time. It's pretty crazy. That was like the one time the NFL put out stack corrections on Thursday instead of Wednesday, and Zeke did not fumble, and it was the difference between me going to the championship and you going to the championship. But uh, you know, you live and you learn, and and this year I'll take down the two million top prize, and you know it'll be water under the bridge. I think that'll be well deserved. And you know what? If it ends up being only a million, we'll just have to say, okay, worth it. Yeah, facts. Fact. There, if you come in the top five and underdog, you're doing okay. Yeah. All right. Well, we've got a fun show today. We're going to jump into underdog best ball stream. Um, let's. Uh, so first off, you were at the FF Expo as well. What's your? Uh, what was your one big takeaway? I got to talk a little bit um, to Overzet about it on Tuesday. Give my thoughts. But for you, what's your kind of one or two big takeaways of that weekend for the industry? I think there's a, a lot of truly like special human beings in the industry. Um, I think the more people I got to meet, talk to them face to face, learn about people's stories. Uh, the the more you can humanize online interactions, I think that the better in this community because so much of it is a debate, and I think that's important, not an argument. And when you when you get to meet people and establish those relationships, I think it pushes all of our content that when we engage on social or shows forward, just gives us better chemistry. I'd also say like the the industry is continuing to get bigger and bigger year over year, right? Like I wasn't at the expo last year, but they almost ran out of room at some of the events for this stuff, and there was there was fans and you know, people recognize you and all that kind of stuff. And it's it's just so awesome to see where this industry is going. And, you know, obviously I'm the CEO for Fantasy Life where Matthew Barry kind of propped up the industry for, for a long time in terms of continuing to move it forward. And and just seeing it all kind of come to life was was fantastic. Yeah, couldn't agree more. Um, we had a best ball panel. There was standing room only. There was a woman in a uh, fantasy football panel that people were having, you know, ushered away, couldn't even make it into the room. It was fantastic. Great to meet a lot. We're going to meet a lot of faces. And uh, yeah, I think specifically with best ball was interesting to see how many people just got, you know, introduced to it over the past year and are loving it. And then still a large factor of people that are fantasy footballers, but like still haven't played best ball. Uh, it honestly shocked me, but like, I'd love to see it. Yeah. That's one of the things too. It's like, we're in the industry, right? So everyone's like, what do you mean? You don't know what best ball is Two two of my best friends play so much fantasy football. And they keep asking me what this Powerball thing is. And I'm like, no, that's the lottery. Best ball is different. And they, I see these guys all the time. And they're like, what are you doing? I'm in, I'm in a draft. What, what do you mean, man? It's May. Like, why are you in a draft? What happens if someone gets injured? Oh, well, here we go for the fourth yep. year in a row. But, like, it takes time to get people involved, right? So uh, I think best ball is just scratching the surface. I, I think we see that people love it. I think it's – especially if you do a lot of home leagues and you're trying to just dip your toes in. I think it's a way better um, – solution than mock drafting where people don't have any money on the line and everything to actually understand and test out different draft strategies and get a sense of where people are going and frankly um listen people have amazing rankings out there i'm not you know etr has some we have some all that kind of stuff i would take underdogs adp right now and just have that be your rankings if you couldn't find another set and i bet it would go a lot better than if you used um the natural rankings on a lot of these sites 
Oh yeah, without a doubt. Uh, I mean, it does very well. I got invited to an industry mock draft about a week or so ago, and I had to politely, you know, first not laugh, but like politely decline. Um, like, but honestly, like, what are you doing? And I get like, oh, there's a content play aspect for it for an industry one, but like, I so do it as a best ball, make it actually, you know, put some oomph behind it. Um, and then the people who are kind of just doing that, you know, mock drafts just for the fun of it here and there, it's crazy. I mean, I remember the days, what, six, seven, eight of those, everyone's dropping out after round five, like people are taking a QB in the first just to kind of screw around. Like, yeah, no, there is, there are much better ways to kind of prepare for the season. Even if you are only doing the $3 Pomeranians or the $5 puppies. Yeah, exactly. And at the same time, you're you're sharpening your skills because a, a big part of drafting is not just targeting players, right? It's understanding tiers and strategies and, and how roster construction will take place. And building a best ball team is different than building a season-long team, 100%. But the more you can practice draft strategies, the better you're going to get at it. 100%. And, uh, yeah, season uh, – you know, let's uh... – Let's get that underdog best ball draft going. As I do this, we'll play some two truths, one lie. And then, yeah, there are a couple comments that I actually want to talk on because I think there's some interesting strategy about what we've seen with the ADP this year. Uh, but we'll jump into that once we start the draft. So, so start them up. What do you do got? The two truths and a lie? Yeah, let's do it. So I was going to, I was debating whether or not I should say something about Elijah Moore, but I figured that would completely defeat the purpose of the game. And uh, I do know how to play. So I'm going to go ahead and say that Michael Thomas has more upside than any other receiver drafted outside of the first four rounds. Sky Moore will finish as a top 24 receiver and Saquon Barkley will finish as a running back as the running back three overall. Okay. So number one, we have Michael Thomas with the most upside of any wide receiver outside the first four rounds. We've got Sky Moore, rookie, Kansas City, Top 24 wide receiver. And then we've got Saquon going bold and calling a top three overall running back. I. You got to go bold on these two, right? Like, I think I would. 100%. I, I think, okay. So I'm going to take my guesses on yours. Uh, I know that you're high on MT. Uh, I'm thinking, and you don't have to give away yet, but I think that that's your uh, definitely one of your truths between the Saquon. I know you put out a tweet about a Madden game around Saquon being a first rounder. Is this like a little, is this kind of uh, showing the confirmation bias from the Madden? I don't know if you've been on Sky more. I'm going to say that Sky is the lie. And uh, it's hard to be a top 24 all across the season as a rookie. He may finish as one as in, you know, points per game with those like last playoff stretch, but it's hard to get that across season. What's the truth? What's the lie? You nailed it. Um, I, I've, I, Honestly, I think Saquon Barkley in Dable's system and being fully healthy, I think he's, you know, he's the guy going in the second round right now. I think he'd be the RB1 overall, though it's going to be Christian McCaffrey if he doesn't get hurt. Um, Michael Thomas, obviously, I he looks fully healthy. It was concerned a while ago. Like those eighth round best ball Michael Thomas shares look phenomenal right now. Jameis Winston has supported uh, wide receiver ones uh, big time in his career. And it's a couple years ago, he was the, you know, he was the Cooper Cup of the NFL, right? Just was getting massive volume. No Drew Brees. I think the A dot improves a little bit, but I just I think he could be a target hog again. And Sky Moore is a guy that I like. I know he's just so popular. One of my teammates, Peter Overzet, absolutely loves him. Uh, every time I say Elijah Moore, he says, "You mean Sky, right?" Um, or or I say, "How much Elijah Moore exposure do you have?" And he sends me screenshots of Garrett Wilson. But um, yeah, I, I think Sky Moore is kind of. Uh, he's he's a highly volatile guy right now that has a lot of industry love. So I tried to sneak that one in there, but I guess the, the Madden video is what gave it away. <laughs> it must have. But uh, yeah, I mean, I think both those are pretty bold um, for me. Like I think the Michael Thomas, I haven't been drafting him at his current value from more of a game theory aspect where I was you know, hammering. Here, let's take a look. Um, Michael Thomas... Yeah, so I was my average ADP on him is 85, and I was going pretty heavy on him early on, um, all the way to 56. I think like I don't disagree with you that he still has that upside. I think there's caution that needs to be taken from a best ball perspective, just because if you are drafting him now, you are giving up substantial leverage against the field. Um, but he still could smash, and like that still could sur you know surpass his what fifth round, late fifth round value right now. Yeah, I, and I completely agree with you. A lot of my Michael Thomas shares were uh, earlier. It's it's like George Pickens. I think you said that too, right? The best time to to plant a tree was twenty years ago. The second <laughs> best time is now. Like Pickens, 
uh, uh, I was talking to someone at the expo about it. I would have drafted more of Pickens in the 15th, 16th round, but I was like, I feel like I'm just clicking this button every time. I was almost getting draft fatigue of drafting yeah. George Pickens. And now here he is in the 10th round, somewhere between Randy Moss, Jerry Rice, Terrell Owens, Calvin Johnson, and Julio Jones. Um, I mean, did you know he's the first player to make the Hall of Fame before playing an NFL game? It's, it's, I actually heard they're renaming uh, the Hall of Fame. They were, they were painting over the field and calling it the George Pickens field. Um, <laughs> I do, I do think there's a lot of validity to it, too, because his his profile was phenomenal, but his breakout age was phenomenal, his athleticism. I, yeah. it's, we're on the clock, though. So uh, We have an interesting situation. I'm not sure if I have ever comp- compare, uh, combined these two, a Dalvin and Henry. Um, what are your thoughts on going with a unique build from the 12-13, or do you dislike one of these guys too much? Uh, I'm big on Dalvin Cook, as I see you are too, with the 22%. So I think that makes a lot of sense. Henry is one of those guys that I fade, but at 113, it's not terrible. Uh, I think there's not a receiver there that has value. Um, And Saquon's gone. Typically for me, I'd go Travis Kelsey uh, in this spot, Um, but I'm good with Henry or Kelsey. Okay. Yeah, I agree with you. Um, I'm definitely more in the Kelsey than Henry. Even my 7% was kind of earlier on in the offseason when I didn't have a full – I guess my, my full grasp on things uh, definitely have slowed down. And you could see I've got him ranked and ETR does after Travis Kelsey. But I think this is one of those examples where you got to go for the uniqueness. I think there are probably very few teams that have Dalvin and Henry to start this off with both of them having ADPs around that eight area. Um, so happy to take that uniqueness here and lean into a RBRB start. Yeah, absolutely. And now you kind of you you basically set your team up that if Cook and Henry stink, well, your team's dead anyway, so you don't really need to add that much more at the running back position. For me, this is where I start looking at um, does Kyle Pitts fall, which he continues to climb up boards. Does uh, what receivers are there? Probably Jalen Waddle, Gabe Davis, that that range of guys. But uh, DJ Moore. Yep. DJ- love love me some DJ Moore in that area, and yeah. Well, we're gonna have picks 36, 37. DJ Moore. I think his ADP was let's see, was it still thirty nine? Who was it? Moved up a bunch. I'm trying. To- yeah, 33. Okay. Maybe DK, he's still a little lower, but yeah. Um, but, but yeah, we we'll, would love that. We'll, we'll see what falls to us. Um, all right. I said I was going to mention one of the things with uh, Jordan earlier. So, yeah, Jordan mentioned we were talking about the ADP aspect. Like, feels like, you know, with less casual, it's a lot less stacking recently. Um, and so I think. I think there's an interesting conversation around ADP with regards to stacking and how you mentioned, like, hey, if you just went off of, you know, underdog ADP versus ranks, I don't know if I put this tweet out or I put it in my drafts or I was planning to, but one of the things I was kind of digging into is the wide receivers later in drafts that are being drafted before their QB are continuing to fall because no one's reaching them to stack them. And so I think the examples, Elijah Moore, could be an example, but I honestly even go a little more later, like the Garrett Wilson and the Corey Davis. I think Jahan Dotson is a great example. Where like, if Jahan Dotson just had a QB who was drafted before him, more often drafters would be like, "Hey, I took this QB and now I'm going to grab his counterpart." But no one's really dying to go grab Jahan Dotson because it's not a stack partner. And so I think that's probably a bit of an arbitrage opportunity that we're seeing where these, yes, like. It's accounted for their ADP because they're on worse teams, hence their QBs being drafted later. But I think we're also double counting by not drafting them because we haven't taken their stack partner. Yeah, and I would with with Dotson one step further is that you know Watson's suspension just came out of uh, eleven games today, but he's been going after Dotson too. So he might that might be the one week seventeen game where both quarterbacks are going after the the top end weapons, and they're just constant. There makes him fall even that much more, right? Because you don't. I guess you could run back like a Nick Chubb team with Dotson, but Dotson's a top 16 pick in the NFL draft. Uh, he's going way too late in drafts for, for my liking. You know, he's got big playability. Uh, Wentz isn't good, but he's an upgrade over their quarterback play last year. I, I I really like Dotson. I think that that theory makes a ton of sense too. It's like when you stack Joe Bur- um, Jamar Chase and T. Higgins, all of a sudden Joe Burrow doesn't go in the seventh round anymore. You can get him in the ninth round. Because no one's fighting to go after him. And uh, the interesting with this year as well is the kind of push against it is with these week 17 correlation, we've been talking Gabriel. Okay. Gabriel Davis is being desired by so many people drafting because Josh Allen, Jamar Chase, T Higgins, 
Joe Mixon, Stefan Diggs are all being drafted ahead. So it's pulled Jamar, it's pulled Gabriel Davis up because everyone wants him as either a same stack or a week 17 stack partner. Um, all right, we are coming back on the clock. Oh, look at that. DJ Moore top. and Jalen Waddle are literally the two guys we said we wanted to target. <laughs> Just, uh, you know, usually on these streams, and you can tell I am very heavy on both of these guys. Absolutely love taking these wide receivers. Um, yeah, usually on these streams, you get a little, uh, you know, people want to take them. But today, people are feeling nice. Happy Thursday. Yeah, I think the great thing about DJ Moore's year-over-year consistency on the yard side is there. The the red zone usage is there. They just haven't gotten in the red zone much. And is you Baker, keep going. Baker might, may or may not be good. But the question is... Is Baker the best quarterback that the Panthers have ever had with DJ Moore? You could probably make an argument that he is. And uh, Jalen Waddell is the second year uh, breakout candidate, right? Like I know JJ Zacharyson and, and Matt Harmon and a few other guys have talked a lot about this. Is that second year receiver is really who you want to target? And Waddle seeing 140 targets, that Dolphins offense to me is so interesting because I don't know how you guard them from just a a stylistic standpoint of Waddle speed, Hill speed, Gasecki is an elite athlete, and Cedric Wilson is one of my favorite last round guys to grab too. So uh, I'm big on Waddle. I know that Hill's there. I know it seems a little rich, but that second year breakout with that first year production, you can get an all pro receiver um, like that. Yeah. And between Tyreek and Waddle, if anything, I think Tyreek is the one who's probably maybe getting drafted a little high, but like I still like Tyreek. Um, but my point is, I think Waddle is, if anything, the value. And he could, and I think Leone actually was talking about this, like Waddle could lead the team in targets. It wouldn't be a shock uh, with the style of play, with the connection, the rapport that they already have. Uh, you know, the bull, the, you know, the bear case of this is people talking, okay, well, where are these targets going to come from? If Tyreek's going to start commanding 140, 130 targets, whatever it is. Uh, personally, I think that H is going to be a more efficient offense. I think we're expecting, hey, that full year out of two without the injury. Um, and hopefully that, what, third year uh, leap. Um, but also, I think Gesicki is going to be the loser. And so, so has been heavy on this, like putting him on his do not draft list. Uh, if Gesicki's not playing that wide receiver type role that he used to in the past, that is where a lot of these additional targets are going to go to. Cedric Wilson, Tyreek, and Waddle can maintain his. So, uh, I'm not scared of the, you know, additions here. I think it just becomes a stronger offense. And, uh, yeah, Waddle still has the opportunity to smash. Yeah, I, I agree with you um, in terms of – I think Gasicki's not the worst um, stack option just in terms of being a little bit different. If a, if a Tua team with Waddle gets you there and then all of a sudden everyone has uh, doesn't have Gasicki and, you know, all that stuff for, for late. But I, I like this Dolphins team in general. Um, there's been so much made about to his accuracy, but his ball placement is phenomenal. And that's huge for run after the catch. And wa- that's, that's a big part of Waddle's game. So if Tua takes a step forward, one of the ways you continue this, to get more targets is they have more pass attempts because they're more efficient. They stay on the field uh, on top of the fact that Gesicki could lose some. And I, I think mostly it'll be like Hill and Waddle. And then if you take completely take them away, Cedric Wilson and Gesicki will, will eat, eat you alive. Are you cautious fearful that with you know mike mcdaniel coming in that they just become far more of a run first team i mean we did see that with him in san francisco we know he has that tendency now the after the catch ability and what he's able to do and put his uh, receivers in space is phenomenal but like i'm I'm a little scared i'd say that's where my concern comes in is what if this is just a run heavy team and now there's just far fewer uh, pass attempts than we're projecting. Yeah. It, I, is it a possibility? A hundred percent. I think it's also a question of, you know, coaches have their tendencies and they also have where all the team just spent all their money. Like they literally just built the team for Tua to be successful. They got an elite pass blocking left tackle. They went out and they traded legit draft capital and make Tyree kill the highest paid wide receiver in football. Um, I don't know why you do all of that and then just say, hey, Raheem Mostert and Chase Edmonds, we're going to rely on you to win games. Right. Yep. That, that's what makes me feel good is because teams, when they spend money, they want to use those players. Right. Same argument with the, I mean, with the Eagles. You don't, right. bring, you don't bring in A.J. Brown to just run the ball all day. 
It's, right. I mean, it's it's a it's a simplified, but it's the same reason why we care so much about draft capital, right? It's because right. teams, when they spend money, and it gets into the human aspect of general managers and coaches and all that kind of stuff. When they they plant their flags that these are their guys and their jobs are on the line, they want to give those guys as many opportunities as possible. Yeah, completely agree. Um, all right, we are coming up on our turn. I think an interesting conversation is so we go Dalvin Henry, Moore, Waddle. None of these have a stack partner in like an elite QB. Um, are you kind of thinking like, hey, I'm just going to, you know, maybe go with two or three of those mid late QBs, maybe a Cousins, a Tua, or is it, no, I still want to try to get an elite-ish QB and then find some later stacks? Yeah, I, I don't mind uh, Kyler or Jalen Hurts in this range either. Um, Chris Godwin, if he makes it to us, I think is a that's a, a late area for him to go. Um, and we know he's got a lot of upside. Um Cooks is going a little bit later too. You know, he's got a, a nice little floor in terms of everything. Um, to me, it's Chris Godwin and either Brandon Cooks, Kyler Murray, or Jalen Hurts. And then you kind of hope that a Dallas Goddard comes back around, Chris Olave, something like that. And then you kind of have a nice little week 17 stack there. Uh, Tom Brady's also been falling a little bit. So my guess is he might fall too with the Chris Godwin team. And then, you know, Julio, Russell Gage, all those guys are available later. And we just did Chris Godwin, DJ Moore, which is a nice little week 17 correlation as well. I think I do like that 17 correlation. And maybe that's enough of a say, hey, let's go with the Houston here. Um, you know, we are getting a good value on Cooks at 51 versus 61. And if you go, grab Kyler, Hopkins is going too quickly. You could pair with Rondale, but you're really getting a peripheral piece. Uh, you could go Hurts. You're missing out on A.J. Brown. You're likely going to miss out on Devonta Smith. Uh, yeah, 76, maybe he falls. Um so I think I'm in agreement with you. Like, hey, let's take the clear value. We did still need another strong wide receiver after our start. Um, and hopefully we'll get a little lucky with maybe a, you know, a Brady, um, maybe some other stack. Yeah. And honestly, you like one of the arguments for the, the, the strong running back start, right, is those four receivers are not bad. Uh, that we just stacked up. Those those guys have a very nice floor ceiling combination on a weekly basis as well. Once Chris Godwin gets healthy, is they should be seeing eight plus targets a week. Yeah, um, all with, three of these wide receivers could be a wide receiver one on most weeks, yes. and that's that's a really good feeling. Yep, and we've got two running backs that when healthy will be projected in the top twelve every single time. Yeah. And uh, so when we are thinking about like what structure we're looking like, uh, we did miss out on the elite tight ends, um, you know, really never had too much of a chance to grab one without reaching too much. So I think it was the right play to not grab one. Um, I presume we'll probably end up with a three tight end build. Mm -hmm. We're going to have to see whether we can sneak in a two QB or a three, but if we end up with only four running backs, Probably not in the worst case. Definitely not going to go more than five. So we do have a little flexibility. I, I completely agree with you. Uh, Brady really helps determine how many quarterbacks we need, I think, if he can fall. Um, like you said, the only tight end that we even had a chance at was Travis Kelsey. But it's a tough spot because Andrews typically doesn't fall. I guess you can overdraft him, right, in terms of ADP and to be a little bit different. Uh, Pitts used to go with the turn. And now he's going before it. And Waller and Kittle rarely fall back to you. And if you're not going to get one of those top five guys, I guess Schultz, if he sometimes he falls randomly, isn't. But to me, he's not really in that conversation. Yeah. Um, you're you're looking at probably a three tight end build if you don't get one of those guys. And now that you have the turn, it's basically like Kelsey. You're overdrafting someone, which isn't necessarily a bad thing in large fields at all, right? ADP is not law. It's just it's a good uh, barometer for value. Or and you're then, waiting and you're getting a huge value. If right. Kittle or Waller fell to this 60, if Pitts did fall to 36, 37, which is possible, but yeah. So it, having the turn almost really determines, like if you want to go two QB build you're, or tight end build, you're probably taking Travis Kelsey. Yeah, I agree. Uh, and then are you giving up like some uniqueness aspect maybe because Kelsey's at the turn is so popular. Uh, so right. we'll keep an eye. I also am very content with three tight end builds. I think there are just such strong tight ends going in the like 14, 15, 16th rounds that uh, if I grabbed three there, like I'm not, not upset at all. There's a lot of tight ends in that round uh, in that range to attached to big quarterbacks and big offenses, right? Like a, a Hayden Hurst, a Gerald Everett, 
Um, um, and the, the nice thing about those guys is they can be a way to be different that if your team sneaks in, right. And let's say it's a Joe Burrows, Jamar Chase, T Higgins, double stack. And then week 17, all of a sudden it's the tight end. CJ Uzoma catches two touchdowns and chase like you're just destroying everybody else. So I love getting those uh, Tyler Higby is another one like late, late round tight ends and good offenses that are a way to be different in, in big games as well. And you're getting leverage on those elite players as well, because right. if Hayden, you know, Hayden Hurst ends up getting two touchdowns there for Cincy, like that's two fewer touchdowns that could have gone to Chase Higgins or even Boyd yep. or even Mixon. Because, yeah, I mean, those are all yeah, but three guys in the first two rounds. OK, that's one of the reasons that Hurst is one of my most drafted tight ends in this format, too, just because I think it's such a leverage play uh, on the rest of the Bengals. Nice, nice. Um, yeah, and I mean, I've, I don't want to rehash it too much because I brought it up on the stream many times before, but the three late tight end smashes last year of Knox, Schultz, and Gronk were <clears throat> all on very high-powered passing offenses. Yeah, yeah, to me, I either want an elite tight end or I want a tight end attached to a big-time quarterback. Noah Fant is my one exception just at where he's being drafted so late at like that 172 uh, from a talent perspective. But other than that, completely agree. And the data shows that you want to just get the tight ends that are attached to the high-powered offenses. Yeah. Um, Geno Smith definitely scares me. But, <laughs> hey, uh, true lock is starting. Then, didn't they come out yesterday and say that it's a near lock that Geno's starting? But did they say near lock? lock? Like, was it a play on words? That's, that's like what I'm saying. Near... Like, I just saw it quickly. And now that I just said it out loud, I'm like, I am I no longer have any confidence that that's actually. <laughs> All right. We'll take Brady here. That worked out well. Also, ADP's right there. So that gives us the Godwin stack. Um, what are we thinking after this? I was going to say, I actually really I'm like just... Clyde Edwards. Uh, a okay. Lot of, um, just from an upside play. Look at that Traylon Burks exposure. I know. Uh, I, I love it, but I hate it. <laughs> we got 15 seconds. Um, I like CEH. Okay. I'm good with um, CEH. I'll, yeah. I'll give my CEH take here in a second. Also, CEH versus Sanders. We get the buy, uh, you know, cor com uh, it's not really correlation. I don't know. Um, You're protected on the bye week in terms of you're only going to go four running backs. Exactly. You're not going to get yeah. stuck. Whatever yeah. word we want to assign that, that's what we're complimentary. Talking. Yeah, their bye weeks are complimentary. Um, okay, and so yeah, I think with the CEH, and I think it was Wiggins earlier today in chat was saying like he thinks this could be the big year for him. Um, earlier on in the offseason, we were scared of CEH because that Rojo signing, like that definitely put a bit of dampener in. Like then McKinnon signs, and we expect McKinnon to continue to have that third down role. Uh, the Pacheco news is all very interesting. But if anything, it's just given me more confidence in CEH because I think if the team knew that they needed like a, you know, legitimate competition for that first running back, those, you know, early downs, you know, between the 20s, maybe even goal line. Uh, I think Ronald Jones has a greater likelihood of kind of winning that job if they really needed that right now. I think what they've seen is, hey, if they do actually only want to hold three running backs and, you know, McKinnon has the pass down role, CEH is that main guy. Well, now you're going to go for upside with your Pacheco. And, uh, you know, the reports have been great. So, yes, Pacheco's nice, but I think it gives me more confidence that CEH really could be the guy this year. Yeah, I couldn't agree. When Ronald Jones is now on risk of not making the team, um, CEH is going to be that first and second down guy. He's still going to catch some passes. He, it sounds like he's got a good chance to be the goal line back, too. You're getting a running back in a high-powered offense. And a guy that, and I, I love taking guys that basically was a second, third round pick last year. Everyone has now sworn off, which is why he probably goes in the eighth round instead of the sixth. And all of a sudden it's like, it's a very low risk, high upside play. Yeah. Yeah. hundred percent agree. Um, and yeah, I mean, in the high power week 17 game with Kansas city, it gets correlation off of the Kansas city pass catchers in case it's a game where like they, you know, he ends up having two, three touchdowns. Uh, I'm all aboard it. I'm also a little tilted. Russell Gage going 90 right here. Often he's been the one tens and stuff. We thought we might be able to get him here with some value, but uh, we missed out on that. So we'll probably just have Matty to ice him. took Antonio Gibson in the seventh round, um, which is the highest I've seen him going. Like the last week, as everyone has determined that he no longer plays in the NFL. 
Um, no, he plays. He just plays in special teams. <laughs> but um, that this whole the whole this whole tier, right? The RB dead zone of Antonio Gibson, Miles Sanders, Josh Jacobs, David Montgomery has just been a, an interesting ride. If those guys were going the sixth round, now they're starting to go in the eighth round because people realize um, those guys that don't aren't going to catch that many passes that aren't on good teams. Well, Sanders and Jacobs are on better teams, but. Um, and aren't going to score that many touchdowns become a having 12 touches a game between the twenties doesn't really do me any good as a running back. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I like Sanders cause I do think just such a highly efficient offense that he could put up some substantial points. Um, but he's also always been kind of in this range. It was the Jacobs, the Gibson, David Montgomery that were really in that tier above. And it's interesting two years ago, that would have been probably like the fifth round. This mm-hmm. year, we kind of got sharp and we're like, no, nah, that should be the sixth round. Now it still took time for people to realize, even though projections wise, they are more likely to end up from an RB perspective in like that sixth round, what you're giving up in that sixth round for those QBs, for the wide receivers, and what you're getting from a lack of upside, it doesn't make it worth it. Instead, take the riskier James Cook, Damian Pierce, Chase Edmonds. Yes, their jobs are not nearly as secure, but they actually have far greater upside and it's happening in the ninth, tenth rounds. And that's also where it goes back to understanding your, you know, the league type you're playing in, right? And, and what your goals are and everything. Because um, you want that upside, you want to capture that upside, and you're, you're swinging for the fences to try to win $2 million. You're not trying to beat 12 people. It's a completely different. Um, what so do you feel on? on? The, we're in the end of the ninth. Oh, wow, there's Pickens. Um, speak of Randy Moss. Um, <laughs> if there was a running back that you like, we could secure a four RB build. Um, there's a little value here with like a Penny Walker Singletary. I was gonna say with Walker having the groin injury or hernia injury that he just had to have surgery on. Um, I think I don't hate Penny. Um, and they're gonna give him the ball a lot. Um, I like Garrett Wilson. I think it was Mike Clay who talked about basically the history of receivers going in the top 10 of the draft finishes top 30 receiver, a top 30 fantasy receiver, like 80% of the time their rookie year. Um, Any so argument to trying to grab a Dawson Knox Zach Ertz as our top tight end, or are you more comfortable just kind of sticking out the, I, I think that Dawson Knox goes right back to the three tight end build that we talked about in terms of leverage off everything else. So I'm very good with drafting Dawson Knox over Garrett Wilson as well. Okay. I like it. We'll grab Dawson Knox. Uh, I'm not sure if Garrett Wilson really moves the needle with this team. Um, obviously, he has substantial upside, but I do think like the lack of Zach Wilson in the preseason is going to hurt, especially a rookie like Garrett Wilson. Um, there's also the whole, yes, Joe Flacco, Mike White, whoever it is, actually was pretty good for a pass catch last year. I get that. I think, if anything, you can make an argument that helps Elijah more. But the rookie not getting that chemistry and practice time with the QB, I think we will – that'll actually have some downstream negative effects beyond the, just the injury. Yeah, no, I think that's fair. I mean, you it's if anyone who's ever listened to me talk ever in your life, you understand that I love Elijah Moore, right? So I'm certainly not going to counter that one. But You mean um, Sky Moore. <laughs> I, I do think uh, one, one thing I want to throw out to you that's interesting is like we love Week 17 stacks, right? Obviously, we have to get to Week 17. That's a challenge in itself all that kind of stuff. We're trying to win the league. Do you take any, um, does it, does it factor in your decision-making at all kind of drafting teams where there's a lot of guys in a similar division because they're going to end up playing each other a lot and potentially having that high correlation, both from a obviously positive and negative game sense, because the second game tends to be a little bit lower scoring in divisions. Um, But I did, I've thought about it before. Just curious as your take on it. Yeah, I'd say to a small amount, I've thought about it. Um, I looked at the Week 17 teams to see how many in-game opponents there are, uh, similar to the Tampa Bay and Carolina, um, and there actually aren't that many. Um, so, you know, and at first I was thinking, like, hey, can I take a Week 17 and then combine it with, well, they're also, you know, in the divisions, so they're having that same schedule aspect. Um, other than that, I would say when I'm looking at the divisions and thinking of, okay, that Chargers, Raiders, Chiefs, Bron- I mean, Chargers, Raiders, Chiefs. Who am I missing? Chargers, Raiders, Chiefs, Broncos. Broncos. Okay. Yeah. You, you um, said it the first time, and I was I like, did. Hey, "What happened?" Yeah, I'm pretty sure you said four. <laughs> I, yeah. Um, like 
we just know those games are going to be high powered games and that's they're playing against each other. You're getting six games in that division. And so that's where like, it kind of is a strength of schedule aspect, but it's more of just from a passing game, I expect there to need to be that kind of, Hey, you got to throw to win. You got to have these big games. Um, and so I've been willing to give a bit of a boost, I'd say to those larger offenses. Um, but I haven't really been trying to do like, Hey, same division stacks. Um, like, Tampa and New Orleans. No, I, I think that makes a ton of sense. Honestly, I, I've just noticed that in terms of the turn area, I've had a lot of like CeeDee Lamb, Saquon Barkley, uh, and I end up with like Devonta Smith, Jalen Hurts, Dak Prescott, Tony Pollard. And I look <laughs> at my team and I'm like, oh, there's going to be a lot of correlated, correlated weeks throughout the season. Um, and then, you know, typically with um, that, you obviously want to f- try to find a Titan or a Saint or uh, a Colt. I do love, um, you can't do it anymore, but earlier in the season when Saquon was going mid to late second and you could try to get some Pitt- Pittman, uh, Saquon Barkley teams and run it back with Matt Ryan, I feel like that's a that's an awesome week 17 game stack. But yeah, yeah I just, I, you're, they're going to be playing each other a lot and it's, it's ways to capture upside throughout the season. And they also all play one other same division. So yes. If, like, even though, yes, we're bad at predicting uh, defenses and scoring across a season, but if you ignore that you're trying to say, which is good and bad, and just accept that, like, hey, Tampa, New, Tampa, New Orleans, their schedule, they're still going to play the same out-of-conference division, whichever one that is, and, like, maybe that division, whoever it is, has three, four really bad defenses, those teams now get the correlation of both getting to play that team. So, like, there is some edge there. Um me, and it's like I the Bills have, and Patriots yeah. last year got to play the Jets four times combined, and all of a sudden the Patriots scored 55 points, and they're like a top five offense on the top 10 offense on the year. It's sometimes when you get to a lot of teams get the same couple bad opponents, it, it allows for more spike leaks. You seem a little sour. Um, oh, no, I'm not sour. The great thing about the Jets, uh, being a Jets fan, is it really helps making the transition to gambling and fantasy a lot easier because you don't need to care because you know they're going to lose. <laughs> Expectation setting. Happiness is uh, expectations minus reality. Reality minus expectations. One of those two. It's the absolute value of that. Um, and uh, yeah, so if you have no expectations, then the reality is it's just going to be okay. So you are you have a, a lot more Kenny Galladay than I do. I'm oh, worried that he's yeah. completely cooked. Yeah, no, I'm not happy with this. Um, and the reason why is because I also love Daniel Jones late. And so it was so easy to grab a Galladay and a Jones, like, you know, backdoor stack. Um, but no, I don't I don't feel good at all about Galladay right now. Um, Jones just this... has that rushing upside and finally an offensive coordinator that knows cool. that they're playing offense. Yeah, exactly. Um, I mean, Dable is the big, big reason for me. Um. I, I love Dotson um, in general. We talked. We started the show with him, right? I wouldn't mind a Dotson. And, oh, Tua's got the week 11. Ooh. That's a little tricky. Because do we want to do the three QB build? Grab Dotson first. Yes. Okay. Um, yeah, I don't think we need – is there – let's see. We could still grab like a Davis Mills and a Carson Wentz. Um, is there another player that like? Is there a Hunter Henry? I mean, it's just an ugly. Like, I, I wouldn't mind Alberto or Irv. We don't have to go to it. It's just it would have been a nice stack after everything we talked about. But Brady's week eleven. You, you're forced to go three QBs there. Let's do it. We're gonna go three QB. We're gonna go three tight end because we're going four running back. So once we took this four running back, like no bye weeks, very strong running backs, both from an upside and weekly value. Uh, this gives us more flexibility in drafting. I think the three at the onesies. Yeah, it it literally becomes a like. I, th- I think I drafted one team and someone said, what does Naheem Hines do for you? And I, I like him more. He was my fifth running back. Um, but literally, if Cook and Henry and CEH and Penny aren't going to be the guys, you know, drafting Jarek McKinnon, or oh, you don't want to do the same team, but regardless for the argument, it ain't, it ain't doing literally anything right. for you. Yep. Um, I think that was that was one thing that clicked in my head early on. I forget who said it, but basically draft like you're right in best ball. Yeah. 
And I mean, yeah, the hyper fragile build that I used for them about a couple of years ago, it was that same idea with the four RBs. And uh, at that time, like, yeah, the four RBs were kind of piecemeal. I think it included like a, you know, mid to late Dave Montgomery, a late Tony Pollard. And those guys were clutched down that stretch to actually provide value. Um, but at the end of the day, like I didn't waste it because the four guys that I had, my two elite guys were great. And then those two were pretty good complimentary. Uh, and I think on this one, we're looking at the same thing. So a three, four, eight, three build uh, looks to be our, you know, kind of our go-to here. Yep. We couldn't, I mean, it's this, it's basically the reason why if I take Christian McCaffrey, um, those teams will never have more than five running backs, often four. Sure. Or, and when they do have five, it's basically because I take them in the top two and then I don't take another one till the eighth, ninth round. Right. And I, I love basically Christian McCaffrey, Chase Edmonds, Kareem Hunt, some version of that, Ramondre Stevenson. And then I'll maybe potentially grab a couple guys late because if McCaffrey isn't carrying me to a championship, then there's really no point of even looking at the team. Yeah. Now, um, on Tuesday, Overzet and I drafted a 1.01 pick, started with McCaffrey, ended up getting Mark Andrews, Tyreek, Lamar. And then we went pretty heavy. So we got our elite QB, our elite tight end, McCaffrey, Tyreek. We then went pretty strong on wide receivers and didn't draft another running back until I want to say like round 9, 10, and then, you know, finished with, I think, five. Uh, but it was that same idea where it was, I know McCaffrey is going to be in my RB1 every single week. Now I'm just hoping between these other four or so guys, I mean, can piecemeal an RB2. Yeah, I I have a lot of teams that look just like the team you just drafted. And every single time I just want to, you know, I want to tweet out that team and just tell everyone how good it looks. It's pretty amazing that it's a bit right. Like underdog does not give Pete the influencer one oh one, but good Lord, the random dice give Pete the one oh one so often every time he's out on a show. And it was my account and Pete shows up and one dot oh one. There it is. It's, I mean, there, there's a little survivorship bias, no question, but uh bit equity without yeah, it's 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 pretty and then he does the sleeper bowl and literally gets the 101 it's it's his luck with getting the 101 is i guess it's assuming mccaffrey stays healthy uh is incredible did he uh did the sleeper bowl happen yet did he take his um bid equity and go for a uh, rando or did he take cmc i'm not a hundred percent sure to be honest um yeah. I it either happened this week or is happening this week yeah, I know he was uh, uh, he was joking, or maybe joking, maybe not, about whether or not like who he should go with that one on one. I do think sniping AJ Dillon of AJ Dillon would be hilarious. <laughs> um, and then is Damian Pearson is there a rookie running back? I'm thinking of that's in it. Uh, yes, there's another NFL player, but I can't remember who he is. I just think it might have been. Okay. He took CMC, Stogie, and GA are saying, okay. So the bit was the faking it out. And then the real was the actual drafting. It makes sense. Okay. Coming back around to us. Um, God, I love chats when they can just figure it out for you while we just struggle yeah. on camera. So I was thinking about putting this person in our for last pick because I think he's dropping because of the potential growing, but like injury is not serious. What a great yeah, I, best ball pick. I like I like McCall Hardman here. Uh, it's, again, now we're going off radar with the Chiefs. A lot of leverage with the McCall Hardman, Clyde Edwards, Alaire. Um, I don't. We didn't take two last time, right? We did. Oh, we did. Do we take Kaseki here then? I mean, Doubles? I think we do. To be honest. Yeah, I've been trying not to take him as much, but we are uh, eight picks past ADP on a team that we're stacking on a team that we need a tight end. Uh, it all kind of just makes too it's, much it's sense. him or Hunter Henry to get the other side of it, in my opinion. Yeah, let's let, let's do. I'd rather take the season long correlation versus yes. the week 17. One billion uh, percent. I'm just and the other thing is we are now um, we got Dawson Knox as our other tight end. So uh, that's uh, if the Dolphins do take that step forward, like we're talking about, those are two tight ends attached to two very good offenses. Yeah, without a doubt. All right, let's get a quick refresh on the team right now. We Let's do it this way. We've got our two QBs in Brady and Tua. With the buy situation, we're still going to need to grab one more. Thinking about who that person could be, people that jump out to me, we got Davis Mills with the Cooks. we got Carson Wentz with the Washington here. we got Baker Mayfield with the DJ Moore here. Maybe even a Robbie Anderson if he falls. Um, 
I think that makes sense. From a running back wise, we've got our two studs at the top, CEH and Penny to round it out, all different bye weeks, almost assuredly locking, stopping at four. Talk to me about our wide receivers. Yeah, so I mean, I think like we were saying before, there's it's it's a really nice balance of floor and ceiling in terms of locking in a lot of guys with eight plus targets and DJ Moore, Jalen Waddle, Chris Godwin, and Brandon Cooks. Uh, Jahan Dotson is that upside swing with the first like first round draft capital. To me, he he reminds me a little bit of Brandon Ayuk, not from a play style, but from a everyone was like, no, nope, he shouldn't go top fifteen, and we don't like him now, but. He gets the he gets the draft capital. Washington should have a lot of green script that favors wide receivers. Uh, he's all reports out of camp are that he looks good and he's a big play guy downfield. Um, I think he's one of the better values in drafts right now. And McCall Hardman is the great example of Drake. It happened to Drake London a little bit too, right? Like he's going to miss a week or a two in injury. camp, and then all of a sudden he's fine. Because yesterday you could have gotten McCall Hardman in a live draft in round like eighteen because everyone's like, nope, he tore his ACL. We're all we're all Twitter doctors now. Where every time someone goes, uh, did you see Matthew Judon's tweet? No, but, yeah, Sky Moore was in the seventh though as well. You got both ways of it going. Yeah, yeah. Matthew Judon, the 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 defensive player for the Patriots, uh, the beat writer said Matthew oh, Judon. Uh, uh, yeah, exactly. Went, went, to, the, he, he went to the, the locker field, room, and then he's yeah went to the locker room and he's like, yeah, I had to pee. Like we are. We are too reactionary with some of this stuff. Like, it's going to come out shortly. We don't need to diagnose every – at the expo, because I was wearing the Elijah Moore jersey, no less than 25 people came up to me saying, I'm so sorry, Zach Wilson towards ACL. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It was a, a six-hour period – not even six-hour, but uh, just the roller coaster of ACL to PCL to bone bruise to – yeah. <laughs> it's almost like a, a blurry image. you like – it takes doctors years to be able to touch someone's knee and have an, a guess in terms of what's happening. Like it's okay to take a, a breath and try to actually understand that we don't need to just be first to diagnose every single thing of a player's right. health, well, especially have, in drafts, right? Like yeah, embracing uncertainty is a, a great way to get uh, advantages. 100%. And I think you have a couple of people who are trying to make a business out of being the, you know, Twitter doctors and then rushing for the clickbait to make a proclamation that this is what the injury is and they can claim they were first. And I mean, it's, you know, it, it, we've seen it from a news cycle. We've seen it from a beat reporter kind of things. It just feels a bit worse when it's injuries and then it's rushing to not celebrate, but rushing to announce and, you know, capitalize on that injury news when in reality, you're basing your decision off of a film that's probably with a film like a phone. Yeah, it's not good. No, and okay. like make your money, right? I'm the, I'm not the I'm not the gatekeeper of how to make money, but I do agree with you that when someone's hurt, let's say they tore their ACL, and you start being like, "I told you he tore his ACL." I don't know if I I love that look. <laughs> yeah, You're right. And hey, wait until it's official, especially when it's not even that. Okay, um, this one feels like a no brainer. Yes. 20 picks past ADP. Um, after that, maybe we should start considering one of the QBs um, to not get sniped because unless there's a wide receiver here that you feel pretty good about. Um, no, none of these wide receivers feel like must to me. I think that Marvin Jones and Jamison Crowder are almost a little of those veteran discounts that people are, are kind of uh, tired of, and then Isaiah, Isaiah McKenzie is the new thing, but Crowder actually had really good metrics, especially winning against man coverage underneath and fits that Cole Beasley role a little bit more than a, uh, a more gadget player to me than Isaiah McKenzie. You get the the multiple bills. Um, so for me, it would probably be Jamison Crowder or one of the quarterbacks. Um, Let's but, do Jamison. Because – I mean, I don't feel any different among these three QBs. Makes no, literally we... no difference on earth to me who we get there. Right. And so I think it's highly likely one of them falls to us at 204, and we don't have a preference. Bye weeks all are fine. Um, for me, with the Jamison Crowder, I think there's two pieces that I really like about it. One is we are drafting him the latest he's been drafted all offseason. So if by the rare chance we are actually right with him, well, no, if he has that huge season, the teams that advance, well, they all have him at that round 12 pick, round 13, we're getting substantially later. So there's value in that. And then second is, even if he is not the starting slot, sounds like Isaiah McKenzie will be, um, all you need is an injury or two. 
And uh, you already know he's playing with one of the most pass heavy, you know, best QBs in the league. Uh, so it's just a, hey, in round 16, we're getting a piece of the Buffalo Bills passing offense. Yeah, I'll take it. And now we have two pieces, right? With Dawson Knox Dawson and Knox Jameson well. Crowder. Like, that's very cheap exposure to potentially the best offense in football. Right. You're getting contingency value that, hey, if there is one or two other wide receiver injuries in that Buffalo wide receiver room, like you're expecting that Dawson Knox has maybe an increased role. You're expecting Jamison Crowder comes in with an increased role. Um, so, you know, like Isaiah if McKenzie, Stephon Diggs gets hurt and no one's rooting for Stephon Diggs to get hurt. But if Diggs got hurt, this team all of a sudden looks like, whoa, right. you have a ton of value. And. You know, people talk about running back handcuffs all the time, but I think there's wide receiver hand, handcuffs is the wrong word, but you know what I'm saying. Like guys who, if there is a top injury, all of a sudden would have jumped five, six, seven rounds. Yeah. It's not the yep. worst strategy. Great. Contingency world. value. Um, and then, so just rewinding a little, uh, Tyler Algier was the one who uh, was also in that draft. Rookie running back, I knew. I was wrong with Damian Pierce, but there it is. Did um, he come out eighth on the initial depth chart? Not that those matter, but that was pretty funny. Yeah, I mean, all these depth charts, it's either one of two things. It's literally either an intern who's just putting it together or in that situation, which I think actually happened, is the coach is actually saying, hey, put him all the way down to give that inspiration. He's um, up to fourth. So look at that. He's he's shooting up the depth chart at this point. Just round of applause for Tyler. I mean, there's I don't know how many running backs can move up a depth chart four spots so quickly. Like, yeah. impressive. Brees Hall came out third on the depth chart, right? And he actually dipped in drafts. He started to go – that day I got him in the fifth round a couple of times, and I was like, guys, he's he was the 34th overall pick in the draft. Like, Yeah. I mean, who was ahead of him? Ty Johnson? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, <laughs> again, just rookie veteran aspect. Now, all jokes aside, I am on team Michael Carter. I think that Michael Carter is going to have a far larger role than people are expecting. Um, and so I think he can come out with a – actually uh you know a lead in the backfield to start the year by the end of it i think it might be a bit more of like a 60 40 um and i wouldn't be shocked if carter actually um gets some high value touches uh and or gets like the receiving work that was two those two mike white games he had what eight and 11 either targets or receptions um they know how to at least use him that way it'll be interesting for the first couple weeks with no zach wilson Brees hall still being a rookie like does michael carter actually have like a substantial role in that offense i think so i think one of the great things at their price is that i think you can make an argument that both guys are very good draft picks at their price i think Brees hall is uh i mean he's he's an elite he was an elite prospect with game breaking ability that has uh uh pass catching upside they traded up to get him not that the stat matters but i think it's fun to know that he was the highest drafted running back in the, for the jets since 1990 um Michael Carter was – he was also a great prospect, right? He was the first pick in the fourth round. He averaged the second most yards after contact in all of college football outside of Javante Williams. Uh, he's got a lot of skills in the pass game, and he goes in that 140 to 150 range around guys that are literally fourth on the depth chart right now. Obviously, we're you know just joking about it. So I think that Brees Hall is one of those guys that his ceiling season makes him – he's going to be one of those guys that's a first-round pick next year. I think that – uh, there's also an opportunity where Michael Carter is highly involved. And I think that it's one of those situations. It's kind of like the Garrett Wilson, Elijah Moore stuff for me. When I don't get one, I'm interested in the other because I think there's discounts on both. Right yeah. Okay. Coming back to us, we're either going to get Wentz or Baker. First off, do you have a preference there? Um, I Wentz think... is actually like not the worst fantasy quarterback in the world. He's just, um, he has rushing. Yeah. He's, he's more athletic. I think I don't know what Baker's ceiling is. I think Wentz on a weekly basis has a better chance to get that twenty-five point game we need. Okay. Um, so and if, if we go does... Baker, if we go Baker, we could go Terrace Marshall. If we go Carson, we could go David Bell as the bring back, or we could go Tyquan Thornton because we already have Miami. And the other thing is, if we go Baker, we have Tom Brady, Chris Godwin, DJ Moore. I think it's Baker and Terrace Marshall. I think I agree. Definitely Baker. We'll get rid of the Carson Wentz. Um, so Cedric Wilson is still the Miami aspect if we wanted. Terrace Marshall does give us more pieces in that Tampa Carolina game. But um, I, don't think, I don't need to overdo Carolina's offense. Okay. Uh, David Bell is no longer really relevant. Tyquan Thornton is a unique player who is a bring back in Miami. 
I'm good with Wilson or Thornton. I think you choose. Let's go Thor. Ah, let's go. Let's go. What do we got? We went Thornton. We went for the uniqueness aspect. We didn't have a bring <laughs> back in the Miami in the Miami game, uh, so that works. Um, and like, yeah, I, I think hey, from a range of outcomes, from a leaning into unpredictability, Tyquan Thornton, he has looked good in practice. We, you know, any kind of a rookie aspect, there's no clear pecking order in the New England wide receiver group. There's a lot of mouths with Devontae Parker, Jacoby Myers, Kendrick Bourne, um, bye bye Nikhil Harry, but none of those really stand out too much, other than I think Jacoby has a pretty firm grasp on like the target monster. Um, but Tyquan could be a, a strong piece in that. Yeah, no, I think that that's all very fair. And, you know, we talked a little bit before, but all these teams get to play the Jets, who is one of the worst secondaries in football. Yes, they added Sauce Gardner and DJ Reed, but uh, that's a rookie corner that you're really counting on against some of these teams. And so it could be a lot of spike weeks. Um, and the Patriots, I I think they're going to throw the ball a little bit more this year than than people expect Mac Jones going to second year. The offensive coordinator situation there does uh, is terrifying with – whether it's Joe Judge or Matt Patricia, I know it looks like it's know, Matt Patricia a little there. bit more, but yeah. like, <laughs> I, I think I would rather pull someone out of the stands. It doesn't matter who, and just say you call plays. But have you played Madden before? Okay, you're yeah. calling plays. Yeah, I would literally be good with just ask Madden if somehow you could keep up with what's happening and you just do all that. Um, but yeah, no, I I really like this team. I think you know three tight ends, uh, three quarterbacks. I, I tend to try to only do three tight ends or three quarterbacks, but. The running back upside we have and the the four receivers we were able to get in a row, I think it, it's a really nice balanced upside team that has a lot of uh, correlated pieces. Yeah, and so we'll take the QB because I think this is a good question from Standish. Thoughts on two QBs from the same Week 17 game? Does it limit upside at all? So I agree with you that it does limit upside because you can only start one quarterback. So you're really limiting the chances of how much exposure you have to games that go off because – if this Carolina Tampa game goes off, QB's points are highly correlated against each other. Uh, so you're likely going to either miss together or hit together. So agree with that. However, when it is such a late pick with, you know, Baker being so late, I'm okay with it. The second aspect I'll say is if you're also doing it around a larger game stack, well, now it's not so much specifically that you're getting the two QBs, but what are we also pairing around it? And I love getting as many pieces as possible for a week 17 game stack, especially a game that, hey, good weather, uh, you know, has the potential to be upside. Uh, we know that the way to beat Tampa historically has been passing and we've got the passing offense there. So in this situation, I'm good with it because we've got strong pieces surrounding it and within that game. But would I draft, uh, let me think, uh, Joe Burrow and Mahomes or no, no. Russ, like, would I go Russ and Mahomes or Burrow and uh, Josh Allen? Probably not, because now you're investing a lot. And same thing with that is in that game, it's unlikely that both, you know, you, you can't get the punch from both, both QBs. Give me chances in multiple games to hit the high hitting QB. I would also say one thing that makes Baker unique here is that the, the Bucks are 10 point favorites in that game right now. Right. So there's there's a lot of opportunity for Tom Brady to th throw for four touchdowns in that game. And Baker's just chucking it, and that's all DJ Moore upside, right? So, like, yeah. if Baker has a massive day and beats the Bucks, and DJ Moore's not available in it, like, it's one of those kind of like I'm also willing to tip my hat on it. And like you said, it's the last round; it's a correlated. It's to me the Baker pick is more correlated for DJ Moore throughout the whole season mm -hmm. than it is against uh, Brady and the Bucks on Week 17. Completely agree. And uh, I will mention. Um... Yeah, I'm not going to mention it because I completely forgot it. So that works too. <laughs> there was something. Um, oh, Baker. Uh, also, earlier in the offseason, didn't really have a team. We didn't really know what was going to happen with him. So was not being drafted in every draft. And so being able to get a QB that is only on, you know, less than I'm making this number up, but it's probably something like around 60% of teams, maybe 70%. Yeah, it'll be a little more than that because later on we're going. So I'd say 70 some percent of teams will actually have Baker. You are getting a little uniqueness aspect. Yeah, it's a great call. All right. So overall, yeah, agreed. A unique 3483 build. But once we knew we were locked into four running backs, okay with adding a late pick to QB. Our tight ends, I think we actually got really fortunate with where getting a stack partner, getting 
almost two rounds of value with Gerald Everett at, uh, Everett and having some weekly upside with Dawson Knox, as well as that leverage off of the other Bills pass catchers. Um, overall, I think this is a pretty strong team. Um, I, I, I like it. I like where we ended up. Yeah, and I like that our, our later receivers after our core four was Jahan Dotson with big-time upside. Guys like McCole Harmon and Jamison Crowder are attached to very good teams, uh, quarterbacks. And then Tyquan Thorn is a second round receiver, which we know those guys tend can do a lot and come out of nowhere with game breaking ability, uh, just in terms of his speed. So I don't think there's really a hole on this team uh, in terms of the way it was built. And at the end of the day, that's all you can really ask for. Yeah, I like it. Well, Elliot, this was fun. Thank you for joining me. I know you are a busy man. Where can people find you? Give them a little heads up about, uh, you know, the MB fantasy life. What's going on and uh, what should people keep an eye out for? Yeah, absolutely. You can follow me on Twitter at Elliot Christ. Uh, you can go to fantasylife.com. Everything's 100% free. Sign up for the newsletter. It's filled with great information. Pete is the one who writes it. We've talked a lot about him. Um, just going to be continuing loading with new tools on the website. Got our, our Sirius XM show. You know, YouTube, social, follow us at MB Fantasy Life. Appreciate all the support. Um, and this was this is a blast, Justin. I, I hope that this team wins it all and you and I can have uh, fun celebrating that one. But uh, I appreciate you having me on, man. Big fan of yours and everything you guys are doing at ETR. So, you know, just keep crushing and, and best ball season, man. It's it's amazing. I love it. It's fun. It's a whole new, whole new generation that are introduced to fantasy football. This new, fun, just so much more simple way. No more waivers, no more trades, none of that in season management. All right, this is fun. Chat, you were fantastic. Uh, Elliot, it was great having you on. Everyone else, we will see you next week.